June has come upon us, and the month of May has come to a close a couple weeks ago. So I'm going to rank all 11 new May releases that I saw. Hi, my name is Nathan, and I talk about a bunch of movies on this channel. If you're new here, down below in the comment section, share your ranking of all the new May releases that you saw. If I missed out on anything last month, share down below in the comment section and suggest a movie that you think I would like. Over on my channel, I have more content like this. Check those out once this video is over. And if you enjoy this video, click the like button and be sure to subscribe because that really does help a lot. Also, for the past week, I haven't been posting out content because my family was actually on vacation to San Francisco. And so we went there. It was a nice new experience. And now I'm back home and I've caught up on some movies. So I get to share my thoughts on some May movies. So that's why I haven't really been posting reviews out because it's been busy in life. The week Furiosa came out, it was the week where I took finals at my school, so I did watch Furiosa, but I had to study for finals rather than shoot the video. I really did want to shoot the video for that, but I have seen that movie. And so I just want to talk about all the movies I saw this month. With that said, let's just get straight into the ranking. In last place, Pool Man. Now, if you don't know what Pool Man is, this is a film that is directed, written, and starring Chris Pine, and it's pretty horrible. What a piece of junk! It's basically like a comedy, kind of, kind of thriller, mystery, noir, but it fails on pretty much every single level. The thriller side, the mystery, the main plot itself is unengaging. You don't care about anything going on in this movie. The comedy, when it does happen, it, the timing is so bad and it feels so forced and it's not funny at all and whatever they were doing here with the whole genre mixer I just didn't get it I didn't know who this movie was made for I don't know what Chris Pine was going for it's a shame because I enjoy Chris Pine as an actor but this being his directorial debut I kind of don't want to see anything directed by him again and it felt like so much setup with all the mystery, noir, thriller stuff. And it led all up to the buildup was a cheap joke at the end. It was like a cheap payoff. It was like a, a punchline that wasn't even funny in the first place. And probably shouldn't have been surprised by this. This movie played at a film festival last year. And it has like a 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. So I probably shouldn't be surprised that this movie's in last place. I'm not even sure why I bothered watching this movie. But I watched it and so I have to talk about it here. And it, it's, it's awful. Nothing here works. So it comes in last. Number 10, Unfrosted. But to be clear, there's not a very big gap. Actually, these bottom three at number 11, 10, and 9 are actually in, like, in my bottom five of the year thus far. So... There's not that big of a gap from number 11 to number 9, but number 10 here is Unfrosted, and if you don't know what this is, this is a Netflix original comedy starring and directed by and written by Jerry Seinfeld, legendary comedic person that has done a lot of stand-up comedy. He, of course, had the Seinfeld sitcom show in the 90s that is beloved as a comedy show, so... Pretty curious to check out what he would do with a new Netflix comedy. This one is about like rivaling cereal companies and the creation of the Pop-Tart. And it's just so really disappointing. And what it felt like to me was a painfully long, cheap Saturday Night Live skit. It doesn't help that I didn't really watch it in the best context. The context in which I watched it was just this last week when we were driving to San Francisco in the car. I just had, like, headphones on, a monitor in front of me, and I put on Unfrosted and in a car. And maybe that made it just feel longer than it actually was. But it's only 90 minutes long, and it feels like two and a half hours of painfully unfunny things happening on screen. Kind of everything to me about, for me about this movie felt off. That is one big pile of shit. The humor felt cheap. The set designs felt like sitcom filmed in front of a studio audience. They felt really cheap. Even everything down to the color scheme kind of looks like a cheap SNL skit. Even with some of the actors they put in there, like, 
all of it just felt really cheap to me for a Jerry Seinfeld comedy. And it's tough to know even who he made this movie for. Like, who is the target audience for this movie? Because it's rated PG-13, but there are some suggestive comments here and there. And there are also, like, the tone, it feels like such, like, a kiddish vibe to it. So, overall, this movie just didn't really work at all for me. Number nine is Tarot. Now, I heavily debated on this list, switching around Unfrosted Pool Man and Tarot. They're all kind of in the same area. They're, like I said, there's not that big of a gap between the three. And all three of these movies are thus far in my bottom five of the year. So, when it comes to the movie Tarot, it's just a very generic, cliche-written horror film. Like, we saw the trailers and it's pretty much exactly what you would have expected. But to me, this one felt unusually worse than some of these other generic horror movies. Earlier this year, Night Swim and Imaginary came out. I see, I've seen both of them. They felt just really bland, boring, and generic. I didn't like either of those. Uh, but I think this one is much worse. Now, it's not common for horror movie characters to, ha to be incredibly stupid. But this movie's characters are on a whole other level than the normal standard stupid horror movie character. And it's kind of like all the actors were given the script and they just didn't care about their performances because all of them just felt really off. Like, they know they're in a bad movie, so they're putting no effort into their performances. <laughs> and some of the characters, like, like, the characters are just so stupid. They do... The basic premise of this movie is they go to, to a, like a cabin in the woods, which is already cliche, and they find a deck of haunted tarot cards to read horoscopes and do this and that, and almost all of them do the one thing that they are told not to do. And especially, like this, I couldn't believe what I was watching. There's literally a scene in this movie where our set of characters are in a car, and the person that filmed their horoscope getting taken is re-watching through it and listening to it. And it's all like, hey, you better not run or else something ba bad may happen to you. The hanged man will have something bad happen to you. Technology will fail and you must not run. Fight the urge to run. The first thing she does when she hears that is run. Like, that's the level of stupidity in this movie. And the same another character does the same exact thing immediately afterward. It's not scary. There's just some really bad performances, like I said. And it plays into the biggest cliches of all time. Like, there's there's literally a scene in this movie where they they Google search a woman, an old woman and go to her house in the middle of nowhere for her to drop exposition. Very cliche. So, I heavily debated putting this one and Pool Man and Unfrosted, switching them around a little bit. The thing that, the reason I put this one above is I think there is, like, one decent kill in it. Other than that, just garbage. Number eight, The Garfield Movie. And to be clear, there's a pretty big jump from Tarot to The Garfield Movie. And I do have a review on this movie. But if you have seen my review on this movie, I gave this movie a C. I don't really enjoy it. But when it comes to The Garfield Movie... I mean, it's much better than Tarot, Unfrosted, and Pool Man. It's a decent enough kids family film. It can, it's funny at point in time, enough of the jokes land at intervals of time that keep you entertained. It's watchable enough. It's just not my type of film. Like, this is a movie made for kids under the age of nine, and it's serviceable if you do that. But, to me, it also really felt odd to do a Garfield movie in the year 2024. Garfield is a character that I think is popular, like, years ago. I mean, when I say years ago, I'm using that word very loosely here. I mean, decades ago. And it just feels weird to do that type of thing in 2024. I am not at all familiar with the old Garfield cartoons or anything like that. But I did find the plot very familiar and predictable. I've, we've seen a lot of movies like this about the father and the son that have to bond with each other and it just doesn't really add much that's new to the mix even some of the jokes are also predictable 
the lead characters played by Chris Pratt and Samuel L. Jackson just aren't very likable that you could root for them and care about the journey taking place. And so, once again, maybe not my type of film, but it's also a movie that on a story level, plot level, just didn't really come together all that well for me. And then that brings us to Atlas. If you don't know what Atlas is, this is a Netflix original movie where Jennifer Lawrence is in a robot suit for basically the entire movie, trying to defeat evil AI terrorists. And if that sounds like, like a lot of fun to you, this movie's not going to really deliver on that. How do you fuck that up? Now, it's watchable enough if you just like sci-fi spectacle. I like sci-fi spectacle, so I wasn't like completely bored watching this movie. It's okay if you love sci-fi, but I also felt like this movie definitely wasted all of its potential. It's a very, it's a very boring version of Titanfall, very derivative of Titanfall, or Titanfall and Titanfall 2. I've played Titanfall 2 before, and even the stuff like Neuralink, you must link to your robot. Even some of that feels kind of derivative if you've ever played Titanfall. Our antagonist plot can feel a little bit sidelined. And there's just nothing memorable to the mix. A big chunk of this movie is Jennifer Lopez learning how to bond with her AI. With how to bond with her mech suit, BT-7274 or, any, or something like that. And that's just a little bit frustrating when you sign on for a movie where big battles are happening... And it's her being, like, unskilled throughout all these battles. There's kind of a character arc, but you don't really care about the characters all that much. And it feels very anticlimactic. So, just another one of these forgettable Netflix films. Number six, The Idea of You. Now, there's a to be clear, there's a pretty big jump from Atlas to The Idea of You. Because I enjoy The Idea of You a good bit. Bit. And this is just a solid romance drama that's like an above average of all these Netflix ones we get every month. It's not aiming for like a lowbrow comedy, so if you're expecting a rom-com, you don't want to go into this movie expecting that. It's much more drama character-based than a rom-com is. And the two leads, they just feel a lot more natural than you normally see in movies like this. It gives kind of a, a vibe closer to humanity, whereas it has this weird premise about a 24-year-old and a 40-year-old falling in love with each other. It's a little bit closer to humanity than it is at face value. It can be wholesome. It can be like a wholesome, uplifting story and with a nice message to it, essentially where these characters are slowly figuring themselves out and it it works out nicely at the end. You know, sometimes it does have plot elements that are familiar. I don't imagine myself re-watching this movie a whole lot. Because this is a genre that I know a lot of friends would love this movie. But, if you do have a boyfriend or girlfriend, this is a, a good watch to put on. It's on Amazon Prime. Why not show it to them? Next up is New Life. Now, if you don't know what New Life is, this is an independent film that I watched kind of on a whim, and this is a really solid film. I thought this was a really solid film, where essentially it's like a mix of genres. It's kind of one part apocalypse, one part mystery, one part chase movie, and it's kind of a really solid mix of that. And the mystery thriller side to it is really engaging. Essentially, the premise of this movie is that a woman is on the run from these authority figures and you and it's kind of a mystery as to what's going on why exactly is she being hunted and meanwhile the person that's hunting her has enough of a backstory that you can care about her and the characters just have enough enough depth to them that it adds a little bit more to the mix and the reveals that they do give you with the mystery on why exactly she's being hunted by these people, they pay off really nicely. Where I think this one, I might have had this one higher up, but I think the finale, where exactly the movie ends in like the last two minutes, it wasn't entirely satisfying. 
I will admit that. But um, otherwise, if you, if you just like small little thrillers that are nice, John Blender, check check this one out. Number four is The Fall Guy. And what I really enjoyed about this film is that it's possibly, or most definitely, David Leitch's film that's made for the broadest audience. It's not like an R-rated action movie. It's PG-13, and I think there's just something for everyone to enjoy here. If you're here for an action movie, it is a celebration of stuntmen and action movies. And it just delivers a lot of fun stunt work and action sequences that you expect for this movie. You can tell the actors are having a lot of fun on set making a movie about making movies and stunt work. But what I really think worked about this movie and what really pulled things together was the romance between Emily Blunt and Ryan Gosling. They have great chemistry with each other and they're just really charismatic, really good at being these romantic, larger than life leads. And in David Leach fashion, the action is fun when it happens and it can be really funny at certain times. Now, I think the setup could have been structured a little bit better, and I thought as fresh and new of a look that it is on action movies, the plot and the main villain himself or herself is quite predictable in the movie. Even before the title card with like the cold open for the film in the theater, I was pretty well able to guess where everything was going. It is a little bit familiar. But if you're just here for a good time, this movie has a good time to offer. In third place, The Last Stop in Yuma County. Now, if you don't know what this film is, this is an independent thriller film. And it's a very, it's very straightforward, simple, and it, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's very short, but everything in this movie to me really worked. I really dug this film and what it does so well is that it has a fairly simple plot but it's very effective and engaging essentially what it is is that the um uh gas station in the middle of nowhere it's like a hundred miles from yuma from yuma county or something like that and it's a gas station and there's no gas because the fuel truck is not is not available at the moment so there's a set of characters that arrive at this gas station and they just w and they just like wait for the fuel to arrive but a couple of the people waiting are secretly bank robbers and as some of the people try uh, essentially like figure that out it's a really effective tense situation and it never lets up it builds the proper tension throughout the movie and it changes the and the way it does that is by constantly changing the dynamic where essentially you have a small group of characters and then you add a new character in the one of the characters tries to do something about the situation and how it, how some things succeed how some fail it just constantly shifts and it keeps adding more characters taking taking some in taking some out and it doesn't overstay its welcome it's very short and so low budget film it's a more low budget film more under the radar but if you just really love solid thrillers i highly recommend you check out the last stop in yuma county now i also highly re recommend you go into this movie without seeing the trailer i didn't go into this movie um i went into this movie without having seen the trailer and it was a much better experience and i then i watched the trailer afterwards and it gives out an unusually large amount of stuff in the movie there's, there's some spoilers in the trailer that uh, it will kind of ruin the experience. So I so definitely recommend it. Don't watch the trailer before watching it, but I thought this was a really, really solid thriller. Our runner-up is Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Now, going into 2024, this one was my most anticipated film of the year, but I wasn't quite sure how you could make a movie set 300 years after War for the Planet of the Apes and still have it be satisfying and I thought this was just the best possible way to do a sequel to War for the Planet of the Apes where despite having 300 years separated between the two films Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes feels 
like a very natural continuation to where we left off in War for the Planet of the Apes, and it just does such a great job at showing the passage of time and how this world would result from all of the things that we saw in the previous trilogy of films, and it's just great at displaying that. And as satisfying as War for the Planet of the Apes is, and War for the Planet of the Apes is one of my favorite movies of all time, as satisfying as the ending of that is, what this movie does very, it does very well is that the consequences that led to this movie, it makes you rethink about the conclusions to War for the Planet of the Apes. And it kind of makes you reevaluate. Was that the best way to go about things? Was that the best way Caesar could have done things back then? And even though Caesar is dead and he's not in this movie, this movie finds ways to explore kind of his legacy and the mark he left on this world, on this generation of apes. And the visual effects, they just look outstanding. All of it looks believable. Like, you're still watching compelling characters, and you kind of forget that they're like talking apes. And they're just so good, because the visuals are so believable, and the characters are compelling. Now, because I had my expectations for this movie so high, I was a little bit disappointed. I gave this movie an A-. minus, And the reason for that, I would say, is that there's some inconsistent pacing, especially in the first half. And it doesn't have as big of an impact on me as the previous three films. But this trilogy, this past trilogy and this film, are just fantastic. So I still thoroughly enjoyed what they did with this movie. But for me, coming in in first place is Furiosa. Now this is the new Mad Max film. And this was one of my most anticipated movies of the year, much like Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I did not do a review on this one like I wanted to. Like I said, this movie came out on the week weekend that I had to study for my finals at high school, so I didn't have time to shoot a review for Furiosa, but I did see it in the theater, and I want to share my thoughts on it here, and obviously it's first place on this list, so I guess you know how I feel about this movie already. And despite being a spinoff to Mad Max Fury Road, this might be more epic than Mad Max Fury Road ever was. Do you have it in you to make it epic? And it spans, and the, and the way it does this is that it spans a large period of time as it's kind of a coming of age story. I don't know that that's the right word to describe it, but it shows Furiosa from a young age to the warrior that she is in Mad Max Fury Road. Furiosa herself is, a com is compelling as a lead character where it shows her backstory how broken kind of that she is, what she went through, the hardships that she faced, and it's just really compelling, and it's done by just some great performances from like Anya Taylor-Joy, I think this is the best thing that I've seen her in yet, but I think even that just like the standout in this movie is Chris Hemsworth, who I also think this is the best performance that he's done, now obviously he's famous for Thor, I just rewatched Thor Ragnarok this morning, but I think this is actually a standout performance, and he just steals every scene that he's in, despite being a villain that you want to see taken down. He's just so charismatic in this movie. The stakes are very epic, but also personal at the same time, and it just found that right balance for the plot and the stakes to be. And it's very satisfying by the end, because all the plot lines kind of merge together into this finale, and it, and it works really, really well. It's very satisfying. And for the fifth film in a franchise, or this really the second film because it's a reboot of Mad Max Fury Road, there's also just probably more world building in this movie than there is in Mad Max Fury Road. I would say this movie is almost as good as Mad Max Fury Road. There's just some fantastic world building establishing all these factions and who's good, who's bad, and it's more complex than that. And the visuals, much like I said about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, are just phenomenal. All the action sequences for an action movie franchise, this, these action sequences are just really good. These are the ways to do car chases. I prefer these car chases a lot more over the Fast and Furious car chases. And the visuals, they're just phenomenal. And it makes it feel a little bit more believable than it maybe should be. And 
so I just thought this was really well done. If I had to criticize one thing about it, I think the first hour could have been a little bit shorter. The first hour is like somebody who's not Anya Taylor-Joy playing Furiosa. It's her as like a 10-year-old, so it's a young actress. Other than that, I just thought this was a really good film and a worthy addition to Mad Max. So it is my favorite movie of the month. And my lights went off. Thank you guys so much for sticking around to the end. That was my ranking of the main movies that I saw. Down below in the comment section, share your ranking of the main movies that you saw over on my channel. I have more content like this. Check those out right now. Thank you guys so much for sticking around to the end, and I will see you in the next one.